thank you all for joining us. I know it's pretty cold this morning, and it's very early, so I appreciate you joining us. Um, so just to introduce everyone, I think everyone knows Shane now. You guys know Shane, Amy from Zero, and myself, Rex from Zero. Um, it's obviously the agenda, We'll just quickly introduce ourselves. I think we've kind of got to know each other a bit better, so we'll, we'll go over those slides pretty quickly. Um, I'll go over some topics around profit and cash and uh, profitability. And then Amy will step in and talk about her beautiful zero product. Um, I'll talk about cash flow management. Shane will then talk about some alternative uh, debt financing solutions that uh, help, can help inject cash into your business. And finally, I'll take you through a seven key numbers assessment. And what that's really all about is sort of wrapping up all the concepts that we're going to learn today and, and showing that and demonstrating how you can use and leverage those key areas of financial numbers to drive improved performance in your business. Um, so Stefan, well, I think we've all quickly had a chance. What, what do we do and who are we? We're basically a team of commercially experienced uh, individuals. We're all former CFOs and financial controllers from the large corporate sector. Now providing services on require, an as required uh, basis or part-time basis to small and medium businesses. So typically the areas that we focus on is really the more strategic areas, profit and cash flow improvement, uh, producing dashboards and, and key performance uh, indicators that are relevant to the business that you're operating, uh, setting targets, acting as a sounding board and trusted advisor. So many businesses don't have somebody to turn to in terms of bouncing ideas off, so acting as that trusted advisor to the business. Developing business growth strategies and then planning and facilitating change. And that could be in financial processes, financial systems, people processes, anything really that, that impact the business. In terms of myself, I'm not going to go through too much detail. So I've got 20 years experience uh, in the large corporate sector, primarily at Ford, now providing my services to small and medium businesses. Um, so my passion is really around working with business owners to grow profitability and cash flow in business. Um, so this chart here shows you the various services that CFO and Paul offer. They're, very quite, they're quite diverse, anything from budgeting, uh, business growth, management reporting, competitor analysis, feasibility, government grants, cloud-based technologies, etc. So really, we're all about taking responsibility of your numbers so that you as a business owner can really focus on what you're good at, which is running your business, and growing your business. Shane, you want to talk about Scottish? <laughs> yep, uh, very simply, might just give you a quick look at the next slide straight yep. away. Um, so Scottish Pacific, we've been around for 30 years. Um, we're Australia's largest non-bank invoice finance provider. So in terms of invoice finance, I'll delve into sort of products mechanics and that later on. Um, but broadly, in terms of where we sit against a couple of banks and where we say we're Australia's largest non-bank, Pretty much equal with market share with National Australia Bank and West Pat Group. So um, between the three of us, we take up about 90% of the invoice finance market uh, in Australia. So we're very experienced with what we do. We've got 2,000 clients roughly in Australia, and uh, you know, obviously representation in there as well. And we have covered in the breadth of the place. Um, from a personal front, uh, yeah, I've got roughly 20 years' experience in the invoice finance uh, game, which means I've probably started when I was about 10 years old. Um, <laughs> beyond that, about another 10 years. Did you have your hair back then, Shane? Yeah, 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 yeah. Afro back then. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, most of those things spent in invoice finance, combination of Commonwealth Bank, Voice Pack Group, um, and yeah, of course, here at Scottish Pacific. So, yeah, pretty good bit of experience at the table with what we do, how we do it. And um, again, we've yeah, got a very experienced team here in terms of our business as well, a couple of uh, leading people in the invoice finance that in a bit more depth as to how it works. Thank you, Shay. Amy? Yep, so hi everyone, I'm Amy. I'm a senior account manager here at Zero. So, a little bit of background about myself. So before I joined Zero two and a half years ago, I was actually working as an accountant. So I used to work with clients day in, day out. I used to help them with their business advisory. And towards the end of my career as an accountant as well, I helped them with their online platform as well. So in that case, was Zero. So what is Xero? Xero is an online business platform to help small businesses take away the burden of you know, data entry and so forth like that, and to be able to give them the freedom to do what they do best. Xero enables the small business owner to work collectively with the advisor, so in this case, Greg, to help them make, solution, to help them make decisions that 
their business going forward. So what I'll be showing you guys a little bit later on is the dashboard of Zero and also how to make it the small business solution with the 600 plus patterns as well. Thanks, Andy. Right, we'll skip over this one. Um, so there's some terms that we're going to be covering today. So just wanted to, you know, what I call the account and ease version. On the left hand side and the plain English version on the right hand time side. So things like when we're talking about debtors, we're talking about customers, when we're talking about creditors, we're talking about suppliers, we're talking about profit and loss statements, we're talking about income and expense report, when we're talking about balance sheets, we're talking about our statement and assets and liabilities. Well, I'll go through the rest, I'll see you taking some photos. By the way, these uh, there are copies of these slides on your desk as well, so that's all the all right, so profits versus cash. The first thing I wanted to talk about really is the importance of cash. So in business, cash is king. We've all heard that before. Uh, you can make as much profit as you like, but if you don't have cash in the bank, the reality is you're not going to be able to pay, pay your suppliers, pay your employees. And I've seen many situations where businesses come to me and say, yeah, I'm making money, but I don't really understand you know, why I've got no cash in the bank. And the reason is they're very different concepts. So as a business owner, very important for you to understand what those what those differences are. So quickly, so what are profits? Profits are a measure of how much your business earns and incurs in terms of how it's accounted for. Uh, sale, sales are accounted for as earned, so i.e. when you build them. Costs are accounted for as, as, as they're incurred as you receive the bill. And assets and investment are depreciated over the useful life. So if you buy a car, I'm saying the useful life is five years, so you divide that by five years and that's what's Whereas cash, on the other hand, is very different. Cash is when cash is in the door, or cash is going out the door. So from a sales perspective, when that, those receipts are received, from a cost perspective, when you actually pay them, and then from an asset and investment perspective, obviously when you pay those bills as well. So that timing difference between when you bill or get billed for something and when you pay or get paid for something creates a lot of differential between what is profits and what is cash. And that difference is very important to manage Sure that you have the right amount of cash in your bank account to fund your working capital payments. So here we've got a bit of an example. Just a pointer here. Let me see. I don't want to. This one. Yes. All right. Uh, just casting you on the right hand side. So this is an example quickly of two businesses, business A and business B. They're both making a seven thousand dollar profit. So oh, that sounds good, right? Um, but due to the differences in the way cash, the cash is received, from a cash flow perspective, business B has a $12,000 positive cash flow, whereas business A has a $5,000 cash flow. So even though they're making the same sales and they're making the same costs, the difference in the timing of those payments can create a very different impact on your bank account. And that's, that's, that's what's very important for you to understand. Next item is really around income statements. So obviously as a business owner, you're not expected to be a professional in this area, but you do need to have a basic understanding of what it is. So the income statement is really around, a, a statement around your revenues, your expenses, and your profit. But there is a big difference between what we define as a good income statement or an informative, informative income statement, and one that is, one that is less informative. So in this example here, and sorry that some of these numbers have uh, messed up a little bit, this is what I can find as a good income statement. The reason why I do that is that it does a number of things. And I guess the question you should be asking yourself is the income statements that I'm getting from my business do these sort of things. So firstly, it reports the current month and the year to date. Secondly, it reports your budget and your actual for both of those periods and what that variance is. And thirdly, it shows you how you're performing against the same time last year. So they're all important measures in terms of how well your business is tracking. You need to understand all those variances to know that you're on track from a budget perspective. And are you better or worse than last year? And if you're not, what sort of, what sort of things do we need to do to get things back on track? Now, this is, there's a couple of things I'd like you to take away from today's session. One of them is really around this. I think one of the most important tools for a business owner to really understand is 
their true profitability. And what I mean by that is understanding your profitability at a customer level, at a product level, um, at a regional level, and at, at a business segment level. And they're all different views of your profit. And the reason why that's important is that if you don't understand profit in that level of detail, you're not able to make the decisions to help uh, maximise your profit or optimise your profits and revenues. Um, and in my experience, this is one of the most powerful things I can do working with the business owners, really around understanding your margins and your fully counted profits at a very detailed level. And what you tend to find is that you tend to make profits on certain customers and certain products, and you may be making losses on others. And so by knowing that, you're able to make some decisions. We increase our pricing on the, on the customers that we're making the loss. When we're spending our marketing dollars, where do we focus? Well, we're gonna focus those the marketing dollars in the areas that we know we make, make a, lot of, a lot of money. So, your financial system should be able to, to provide this level of detail. And any good system, such as Zero, can do that. But it's really around, number one, having the system calibrated at that lowest level of detail. And then number two, having the report set up so that you as a business owner get that, can get that information on a timely and accurate basis. So another concept I want to talk to you about is around break-even point. A lot of businesses don't really understand what that is either, and don't understand what their break-even point in their business is. So what I'm talking about there is really the point at which your, your business or the minimum amount your business needs to sell just to cover your fixed costs. So if you go to the next slide, I'll show you in graphical form what that looks like. So here you can see an example. So we've got a happy face here. This is our break even point. So after this point, this business is making some good profits. Underneath this, not so good, okay? And the reason why that's important to understand is if you know what your break even point is, you can then make decisions to improve it by either uh, increasing your revenue, Increasing your margins, reducing your costs, making your plant more efficient, or more, more likely a, collect, a collection of all those items. All right. So the second sort of you know takeaway that I'd like you guys to highlight or to, to take away is really around having a dashboard that is really relevant to your business. For me, this is probably the number one most important thing that every business needs to have. And it's gonna be different for every single business. The idea of a dashboard is it has all of your key metrics that, or think of them as levers, that impact your profitability and cash flow. Having those all in graphical format so that you as a business owner know where your business is at, where you're healthy, and more importantly, where you're not. So you can then focus on improvement actions. The other important bit about dashboards is that they should be balanced and should cover all areas of your business. So obviously financial is important, so things about things like your profits and your cash and your gross profit margins are all important. But equally as important are other areas such as your cash flow, stock management, customer satisfaction, how many returns are your business getting in? Um, are you fixing issues right the first time? How good is your supply quality? What does your manufacturing efficiency look like? What's your throughput? What's your utilization? Um, innovation is also very important. Is your, is your business continually coming up with new, new products for your, for your market and staying relevant? And obviously compliance with OHS and other legal issues. <clears throat> so this is an example of a, of a KPI report that we've created for a business. Um, so it's all on one page. And on this one page, you see tracking of your sales. You can see that down here. Status of money is owed and owned, and how much of the aging of that. Uh, your customer metrics, you can see that there, how many returns are coming in, production output, uh, obviously your profitability, budget, year to date, and versus uh, and so acuity, and return on investment. The point is, this thing is gonna look very different for every business. So what, what it's really about is designing dashboard that's really relevant and catered to your business, really focus on those key levers uh, that it's had success otherwise in your industry. I'll now pass over to Amy, who's going to talk about today. Cool. Okay. I need the computer. Great. So I'm going to move on to the next slide.
We're gonna get a live demo, guys. So, <laughs> so everything that you guys have just seen that Greg's just spoken about, I'm gonna show you what it actually looks like. Yeah. Just like old times. <laughs> Give me two seconds, I need to go get my authenticator. <laughs> Oh, yes, it's the two-code authenticator on Zero. So with Zero, I want to just let everyone know that we do have two-step authentication set up. So Zero has had two SA set up for over 18 months now, almost two years. So it's that extra layer of security to protect your data. So a lot of people do say, look, I don't trust the cloud. I feel a bit uneasy about it, but it's got the same security as internet banking. We, you know, we trust internet banking day in, day out to pay our bills, to receive our funds, to pay our friends when it's their shout at dinner. So Zero has the same level of security as well. So actually, we've got the authenticator. So bear with me while I enter it in. So there we go. So this is the dashboard. So as Greg was just talking about, the dashboard is so important in regards to your business. The dashboard that we have created here at Zero is a snapshot of your business the way that it stands today. The reason why I say today is because it's real time data. You've got information flowing through from multiple areas. The first one over here, I know you can probably see it on the screen, but if you can just make it out, that is actually a bank account. So you can see there that there's a number of items that need to be reconciled and they're actually coming through to the file via a direct feed from the bank. So here in Australia we have over 100 different direct um, connections with, um, with the banks so we can ensure that you know your data will be flowing through. So it comes through every single morning so you can jump on to Xero at the start of the day using your iPhone, Android tablet or even your computer browser as I'm doing here and you can start reconciling those accounts. Because I do have a limited time, I can't show you how to reconcile it, but Greg will be more than happy to show you guys how to reconcile in Zero and how the direct bank feeds work as well. So over here on the uh, other side of the screen, we've got the business performance indicators. So these are something that I've worked with my advisor, so I'm a small business owner and I've worked closely with Greg and these are some of the business performance indicators that I want to see on my dashboard. So Xero has a number of them that um, are already set up in the file and we've just highlighted them so they jump onto the dashboard when I first log into Xero. So the first one is the account receivable days, <coughs> which everyone loves to see. They love to see how it's been tracking and it also does the comparison for the last previous month so you can see whether um, if it's increased or decreased. You've also got the gross profit percentage. You've also got the net operating return um, and also net profit. Now the next section down here that I want to show you guys is the account watch list. So I know you guys can barely see it but I'll read them out to you because this is a set of, um, you know, really good accounts that I wanted to highlight so I can monitor as I jump into my zero file either multiple times a day or whenever I need to as well. So the first one I've got at the top is inventory because that's obviously an interesting one that I want to monitor. I've also got office expenses. So that might be highlighted here. So I know you guys can't see it, but the office expenses are up there. But the reason why that is really interesting is because that may be highlighted for a reason. So as you've seen from the dashboard, it's also interactive as well. So if I click on the figure from the account watch list, it will actually lead me to that report. So I can drill down to see how much money I've been actually spending in regards to office expenses. So if I jump back, go back to the dash. I've also got the page go withholding because I'd like to know how much I owe the um, ATO in regards to wages. I've also got sales, um, travel and wages and salary. So the accounts watch list is completely customizable to every single um, business owner that jumps onto zero and these are just a number of you that you can highlight on the dash. You can also see the invoices that are owed to you over on this side of the screen. Again, it's Completely, um, you can jump into it and drill down the information straight from the dash and you can also see the bills that you need to pay as well. From within the dash you can also jump in and create the new invoice and you can also enter your new bills. And within Zero you can also attach the files to the transactions as well. 
I'm going to show you guys a little hint in, um, in just a few minutes on an easy way to get the information into the bar so Greg can work with you um, to see the real time performance of your business as well. So this dashboard is, again, I have to mention, it is the health check of your business. When you log into Xero, this is what you see. When Greg logs into Xero, this is what he'll see as well. So it's a great way for you guys to have a conversation with your advisor of what, how your business is actually operating. So as Greg was just talking about before, reports. So as all good accountants, all good small business owners, we want to have a look at our reports because that's what actually tells the story about your business. Xero has a fantastic um, area in regards to reports. This is really one of my favourite areas. One, because yes, I am a child accountant, so I do love reports and numbers and things like that. But it actually gets you to drill down to the information to see how everything's going. There's a whole heap of different reports you can get here. You can get financial reports, you can get sales reports, purchase reports. Of course, you can get payroll reports and all the fun accounting stuff as well. But what I want to jump into is actually show you the way that you guys can do a custom report. So I'm not going to actually drill, I'm not going to create one today. I've actually done one last night at 10.30. You can actually see 12 hours ago. But this is a custom report that I have, that my advisor, my working with me, has created. So this is something really unique to Xero that we have created. You can actually customise the report directly from within the product. So the reason why this report has been created by my advisor is because it speaks to me. Remember, you need to create reports that you understand and speak to you about your business. So this report here, I know you can barely see it, but I'll explain it to you. Please do not judge my report making skills, by the way. I just wanted to show you how customizable it is. So here I've got the trading income. I've got the notes section, which I've added in. I've got a comparison between the budget and actual and I've done a report to actual column as well, so a formula within this um, within this um, report. I've also got the year to date, and I've also got a tracking category as well. So tracking categories is great for regions, so regions, departments, and so forth like that. If you want an example, I actually mentioned this before, I actually use Xero to track all my rental properties. So each location has a different tracking category against it. So when I do my reporting from my PL, each of those locations are shown up in a different column as well. What I've also created here is the gross profit percentage formula as well. So this is something that I've customised in this PL. And you can also go down and you can see a whole heap of different operating expenses as well. What I want to show you guys is the edit layout to show you what I've actually done, how how the advisor can actually customise it for you. So this is what it looks like. You can easily drop in a whole heap of columns. You can drop in rows. You can put in a footer so you can see the notes. I can put the notes to the account so Greg can add some commentary on the bottom. But what's really cool as well is, for example, if I want to group a couple of accounts together, so again, please do not judge. I'm just going to show this for example. <laughs> but I'm going to actually group rent and repairs and maintenance together, and I hit group because I want them to actually appear together. So I'm going to call this grouping again, please, just for examples. And I'm happy with that, so I'm going to just click out of that. You can see I either can show it as separate or together, and I'm happy with that, so I'm going to click done. So that's how easy it is to customize a report. I do suggest that you work closely with your advisor to make the report speak to you. Because remember, it's going to tell you about your business, about how it's operating as well. But because I'm happy with this report, what I'm going to do is go Save As, Custom. I'm going to go Profit and Loss Custom Report 2, Save. And the reason why I'm saving is because I don't want to have to recreate the wheel every single time I jump into zero. And because I love that report so much, what I'm actually going to do is again show you where get it from, so reports, all reports, custom, but I do find that as a small business owner or a user of this, um, you know, this business, I do find it quite annoying to jump through the, the reports and custom reports to get this. So what I want to do is I want to favourite this report. So I just put a star next to it, so every time now I jump into the reports tab and I click reports, it's already there for me to go. Custom report two. So I can jump into it straight away, 
get the information that I need, and it will be updated as you start to update the date ranges as well. So that's what's really unique about Xero. It is like an Excel spreadsheet on steroids within the product itself. You can customise the report, you don't have to recreate the wheel every single time. You can jump in there and see the information as you need to as well. So what I do want to touch on as well is the way to get, another way to get the information into the file. So we've got the filing system. So the filing system is the way to get the you know, information into Xero itself. So may it be documents, photos, anything that is relevant to your business to help you and Greg make decisions about the future. So this is almost like a filing storage on Xero within itself. One thing I do want to mention is there is a number of ways you can actually get the information into the files inbox so Greg can start to action it or for you to start actioning it as well. There is a unique email address for this subscription. So up the top here, that unique email address is just for your subscription. So my hint is save that as a contact in your phone and when you take a photo of a receipt using the apps, so we do have iOS apps and Android apps, take a photo using the app and send it through directly um, using the app itself or even if you receive an email, forward it to that contact with that email address, it will appear in this section here as well. You can also take a photo even using your computer um, if you wanted to. So a little bit of a fun story, when I did a big presentation um, at the start of the year, I actually did a selfie on stage to show everyone that you can use that feature in front of 1,200 of my closest friends. But the best thing about the filing thing the, the filing feature is that you can actually customise it as well. So you can create folders. So for example, over here, if I want to create a new folder called bank statements, because I might be a little bit OCD and don't like everything sitting there. So I jump into the inbox and start allocating it as well. So for example, the smart statement and bank statement, I'll just move it to the bank statement folders. From here as well, you can actually create new bills, sales invoices with the attachment as well. So for here, for example, I'm just going to use the office works receipt and go to bill. And when I create that bill, you'll have the picture of the receipt next to it and you can go ahead and start to enter the data in as well next to it. So you've got that supporting documentation with the transaction as well. So that's all, that's how you get the information to zero and that's probably just a couple of my favorite features that I've just shown you today. So what I'm actually going to do is pass it back over to Greg. Uh, sorry, I've got one more session to talk about. Marketplace. Sorry. So what you guys have just seen as well is just a snapshot of what Xero can do to help your business um, in regards to making decisions and obviously to do the clients and so forth like that. So what really makes um, Xero really, really strong is obviously the way... 24. Huh? Slide 24, I'm just trying to get it on the big screen. Uh, this, this video. Uh, down the bottom right. Yeah, that thing here. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the one. Perfect. Cool. So, what really makes Xero an absolute small business platform is the app marketplace. Because we have over well over half a million subscribers here within Australia and 1.4 million customers worldwide. What makes it an outstanding, what makes it a small business platform? So, within Xero, we do, we can do a lot, but we can actually make it a really, really strong platform for you guys with the apps. So, with the likes of online payment solutions to help you guys get paid faster, with integrations with Stripe, PayPal, and eBay, so they're just some payment solutions. If you guys run an online business, to use the add-on called Shopify to help you guys process your orders and get the information into Xero. And you can also get really complex inventory systems as well. So Xero does have an in inventory feature, but if you guys do um, wholesaling, warehousing and so forth like that, you can get an add-on that will make it a really strong platform to, for you guys so you can start to monitor it. So I'm not going to talk about all the 600 plus add-ons, but there are solutions to help you guys run your business by by integrating it with Xero as well. So Greg will be able to help you out with that um, to make the right decision for you to help you guys operate your business now going forward. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Amy. As I said, you know, Xero is definitely you know, 
a my preferred product. There are lots of other products out there, but um, from an easy to use and uh, functionality perspective, way as Amy showed, you can um, cater a lot of the reporting and, and, and dashboard reporting set up to your own business needs. It's really cool and very easy to use as well. All right, so uh, cash flow. So we've already spoken about the importance of cash flow. Cash flow is king in business, so we know all about that. So what are some of the fundamentals that a business should have in order to have a good cash flow process? Uh, number one is really around daily tracking of all elements of cash flow in a cash flow forecast. So having a having tracking your actuals as well as projecting your cash into the future to ensure that you know you have enough cash in the bank to pay the pay bills when they are due. Uh, also very important to take into account seasonality. So a lot of businesses have seasonality where they have pretty good peaks and troughs. So the most important thing around the cash flow forecast is really around when you have that drop, ensuring that you have a facility to fund that. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. You, know, you can do a bank overdraft, and there are some other solutions such as uh, debt financing, which is a shame we'll talk about later on. Very important to have strong physical control controls over your bank uh, and your cash flow process, which includes a daily reconciliation. So as Amy's highlighted, Zero is an example, has a feature where you can download your transactions, and that should be done daily. Reconciliation is done uh, fairly quickly to ensure you have those right controls. And then also include a robust tracking process for, for, for inventory if you do have inventory in your business. <clears throat> in terms of cash flow forecasting, uh, just a bit of you know, a bit more knowledge about how that works. So, when you're talking about cash flow forecasting, there are three elements of it. Number one is operating activities. So, these are really your day to day. Uh, 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 operations in your business, generating the sales, paying your supplies. Investing activities, and that's to do with uh, cash in and out of the door related to purchasing assets. And then finally, financing activities, which is really cash in or out of the door relating to uh, debt or you know, owner's equity, taking out drawings, uh, contributing extra capital to the business, getting a loan, etc. I won't go through too much on this slide. So, as I said, very important to have a cash flow forecast in your business. Um, a lot of the cloud-based technologies help you do that. This is just an example of, of a good cash flow forecast. And why do I define it as good? So, if you refer to the right-hand side, the first element is by month, so you know where you are each month. So, if you do have a trough, you're falling below your minimum cash point, you need to put a, you know, extra cash into your business. Uh, it's updated regularly. It shows cash inflows and outflows, includes the opening balance, you see up there, and then the closing balance down there. It's reconciled to your physical bank account. So you're having a, a cash flow doesn't tie to your what doesn't tie to your cash account to your bank. And shows also the inflows and outflows related to investing and financing activities. So all those are very important to understand that you have enough cash basis to pay your supplies. Balance sheet fundamentals. So, a lot of business owners don't really know a lot about balance sheets, um, don't really care that much, but it is really important to have at least a fundamental understanding of a balance sheet. And the reason it's important is because it's used for a number of, number of different uh, purposes. Firstly, as a business owner, it's, it's a good gauge in terms of your, the health of your business. And in a second, I'll take you through some ratios to help determine whether your business is healthy or not. Another important thing is a lot of the financial institutions, such as uh, Cost Over Here, will use your, your balance sheet to determine how healthy is your business uh, in relation to lending. What does your liquidity look like? What does your leverage look like? And the reason that's important is if you understand where you're at, you will able to work with your advisor to improve your situation. So say if you want to go, you want to apply for a bank loan or something like that, bank finance, um, you can work with your trusted advisor um, to basically improve your balance sheet to increase your chances of getting, getting those finances. So balance sheet is simply a statement of your assets, what you own, your liabilities, what you own, owe, and then owner's equity, basically your investment in the company. So I'm going to take you through some, some more common ratios that you could be to understand. The first one is around, it's called the current ratio. 
So simply, current ratio is a measure of your liquidity. How able, how able are you as a business to pay your short-term debts? And the way it's measured is it basically compares your current assets to your current liabilities. So if you had a ratio, for example, two to one, you'd be very healthy, it means that you have two, two dollars of current assets for every one dollar of current liabilities. And if you had a ratio of 0.5, that would mean that you don't have enough current assets to pay your upcoming liabilities. So that would be a trigger or a flag of a risk in your business that you need to, to rectify. Then you'd say, oh, how do I get more cash into the business? Um, and, and there are very, very stupid ways of doing that. The quick ratio is very similar to the current ratio, but it looks at, you know, it takes into account the fact that sometimes inventory is not that easy to turn into liquid cash. So it's a measure of the, basically the liquidity taking out your inventory. And again, if you don't have enough liquidity to pay your bills, that's a problem you need to get on top of. Managing customer payments. Now, surprisingly, um, accounts receivable or customer payments is, is, is in some plain English speak, is probably the number one issue that businesses face. So, you know, 90% of the time I go into a business, they have an issue with cash flow. The first thing I always look at is accounts receivable. Because nine times out of 10, the businesses have very poor processes in relation to collecting the receivables from their customers. The reason why that is, is they're quite happy to pay their suppliers on time. Sometimes they pay the bill, which isn't good. But when it comes to collecting cash, they have very poor processes. because it's not really nice to call up people and ask for money, right? But it needs to be done. It's number, the number one important thing in your business is getting that cash in the door. And so there are a number of things that businesses can do to help improve their collections process. I won't go through them all because they're all in your document, but some of them are really around creating a term of business. So making sure that your customer is very clear on what your terms are and when the bills are due. Making sure that, that when you're sending out invoices or statements, they're going to the right person in the company, the person that actually processes the bill for payment is very important. Sometimes bills are being sent to reception or to admin and they get lost. It's a very good technique is making sure it gets to the person who's actually processing it. Considering um, getting uh, discounts for early payments. Um, I won't go through all of these, but making sure really you have a dedicated person. It doesn't have to be you necessarily. That does a lot of the follow-up work, all right? So as soon as something becomes due, there is a process to get it followed up that escalates progressively up the chain to make sure you get your cash back in the bank. Um, another good technique is making sure you have point of sale collection um, facilities or if possible um, to re reduce the amount of credit you have. So moving away from cash flow, now we're talking about some other sort of longer term ratios. Another very common one is what you call the debt to work or debt to equity ratio. So this ratio here is really a measure of um, how leveraged your business is. In other words, how much do you owe, right? And the way it's measured is it's um, the number of dollars of debt for every one dollar of net worth or equity in the business. So an example, a ratio of 1.5 would mean that the, the, um, for every one dollar the owner has invested, they owe 1.5 to um, external parties. Um, so in terms of what's a healthy ratio and what's not a healthy ratio, it does vary by business and by industry. Uh, but typically, uh, the, the optimal ratio would be one for one. Because then if you were to wind up your business, you'd be able to pay it for your debts. Businesses really don't operate in that area. Um, but a healthy ratio would be any area from say one to two, one point five. Above two, red flags start uh, ringing whenever you go to a banker. So supply payments, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Really the key is don't pay, don't pay, number one, don't pay your bills before they're due. Okay? Because yes, that's pretty efficient, but no, that is not good for your bank account. And with the um, uh, cloud-based solutions such as Zero, you can basically program a payment date so that you don't forget about it. You get the bill in, you program it, it needs to be paid on the 30th of the month, the system will tell you that and organise it. Um, the other, um, the other tip I would highlight is perhaps using a credit card with the interest rate um, period wherever you can. 
And the reason why that works really well is basically you're paying for your debts you, and you, you tend to have up to 45 days to pay that bill. So it creates a, you know, interest free loan if you like to your business. Um, but the trick there is making sure you pay your credit card bill when it's due. Otherwise, you're going to be paying very high level. So stock, again, a lot of businesses have very poor processes in relation to stock. So the way to think of stock is basically cash held up on your stock report. That's really what it is. So you want to get, you want to move it as quickly as possible. And that's really the key. And have a system for managing that. Another point is a lot of businesses have a lot of old stock, obsolete stock. They they're holding out of the report. It's not worth not worth doing that. So. Not, the first thing I tend to do when I go into business is really look at their age stock. What can you do with it and get rid of it? Right? You're better off getting something for it than getting nothing for it. And, and that will free up some cash for your business. Some other sort of key techniques in terms of managing inventory is really around making sure in your dashboard you have the metric around inventory returns. Uh, try to get just in time process where you get stock into the door just as required. You know, that helps to maximise your cash flow. Ensure that you have an adequate system for managing stock. So there are quite a lot of add-ons that uh, if you have quite a, a complicated inventory process, will help you manage your stock. One of those examples is um, Unleashed, which, which actually works very well for zero. Risk management and insurance. So unfortunately, with business comes risk. And that's always going to happen. So really, the key with risk management is really around mitigating those risks. So what type of risks do businesses face? Well, they're quite a lot. So firstly, around compliance and legal, and complying with your legal and tax requirements, your OHS requirements, things like that. Your financial uh, risks around business disruption, cash flow management, operational risks. For me, in the small business world, this is probably one of the bigger risks. A lot of, a lot of time, a lot of the knowledge of the business is really held by the business owner. It's typically one person. And that's quite dangerous because obviously if something happens, that person is very sick, there's going to be big disruptions to that business. But the other thing to keep in mind is also that if you do want to sell a business at, at, at a future point in time, a big component of the valuation of the business is really around how much of the business relies on the owner. So the more you can step back from the business and allow the business to run on its own, the better you are from a business valuation perspective. Reputational risk, so obviously it's from branding and strategic risk. Again, this is another another risk I see quite a lot with businesses. They don't really know where they're going. You know, what do they want to be? Do they want to be number two in the market? Do they want to grow? Are they happy being where they are? You know, they've kind of got an idea in their mind, but really what you need to do is have a very clear vision of where you want to go. What's your goal? What are your objectives? And then developing the same line. So the key I said to, to risk management is really around mitigation. So how do you mitigate? Very well things in insurance, but there are other things you can do as well. Uh, firstly, making sure you have adequate controls in place, things like bank reconciliations, uh, help to keep control of your business. Making sure that everything is documented in your process, in your business, all the roles are documented, you have job descriptions. Having a robust business plan and a cash flow forecast so you can respond and look forward in terms of where the issues are. And then obviously obtaining issues practical. In terms of business insurance, lots of different types of business insurance. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but I think we're pretty familiar with all of those. The main point of the insurance is really around making sure, number one, you have the right insurance in place. Making sure you have your indemnity insurance, uh, your property insurance, your current insurance, all that sort of stuff is very important. But not having too much coverage and not having a lot of money. Um, and, the most, and the second point is making sure you have the most competitive premiums. There's quite a lot of insurance uh, agency that work. You can save quite a lot of money by shopping around. So my advice is really around getting a good insurance broker. They tend to be able to help make sure, number one, you're properly insured, you're not over or under insured, and number two, you have the most competitive premiums. Um, so in terms of business finance solutions, I'm not going to go through too much on this. So we're, we're pretty familiar with bank loans and bank overdrafts and credit card facilities, etc. Uh, Shane, the second, is going to go through some different techniques you can use as a business around debt financing. Um, 
I spoke about this already. This is really around this credit card breach for a period of the credit card and tapping into that. So in this example, it has a 30-day uh, free period. Bill is due 14 days after the end of the month. Basically creates a 45-day window of free credit for you. So using that as much as you can, but obviously as I said, paying it off on the day it's due. So I'll hand over to Shane at this point. He's going to walk you through some different finance solutions for business. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'm actually not going to take you through that schematic because there's just too much happening in it and it takes too much to digest it and make sense. But I will use the humble prop instead. So what is debtor finance and how does it work? I sell phones. So I bring in phones from China and I basically sell them in the Telstra store. So when I sell the Telstra, they say, great chain, we love your phones. We'll take 100 of them at $50 a pop. So I've got a $5,000 invoice to Telstra. I've given them all of the phones. Telstra say, great, product's fantastic, but we're going to pay you in 60 days. So my challenge is, how do I actually pay my suppliers, my staff, my logistics, while I'm waiting 60 days to be paid from Telstra? So my supplier in China, he wants to be paid the day they ship. My staff obviously want to be paid every week. And yep, I've got to pay rent, logistics, and the like. So that's where invoice finance comes in. So instead of waiting basically 60 days for Telstra to pay my $5,000 invoice, we've unlocked the value in that invoice so that you get access to 80% of it within 24 to 48 hours. When Telstra pay in due course, basically the 80% that we've lent is repaid, the 20% returns back to you less our fees and charges. So very, very simple process. It's the oldest form of financing in the world. There's all sorts of variations on a thing though as to uh, if you like how and where we do that and how, how it works for the customer. So as we've noticed on there, we advance funds up to 85% 80, of the invoice value, generally we're around 80. And then it comes in to how we actually collect the debt and when we leave that in the customer's control of whether we undertake it. And there's all sorts of options as around whether we can provide insurance overlays, those sort of things. But Greg's touched pretty heavily on the on cash flow being important for the business and this is what it's unlocking. So quite often we have a little balance sheet for a client. The biggest asset on the balance sheet, not so a nine times out of 10, but probably at least 50 to 60% of the time, is the age receivables. And that's only really tied up when you're just waiting for people to be paid. We'll move on. So why would you use set of finance? Firstly, it funds rapid sales growth. So again, for clients that are growing quickly, their age receivables is growing. They've got a lot of money tied up in their receivables that they need to unlock so they can continue to invest in the business, grow the business, and as Greg pointed out, supplement their cash flow. It enables to pay liabilities on time. So again, a funny example, I've got my money in 24, 48 hours from when I've raised the invoice to Telstra. So all of a sudden I've got that cash to plough back into the business to pay suppliers, staff, and the like, and make sure everything's done on time, and then I'm maintaining the credibility of my business. Greg did touch on offering settlement discounts to your customers as a means to get your cash in earlier. Depending on the level of the settlement discount, it can be cheaper to actually fund the invoice via a debtor finance facility for up to 60 days. So, Sorry, I have a quick question. Um, does this facility work with education? Yep. Yep, okay. Um, for example, a lot of the major retailers, so if you're going into Woolworths or Coles or something like that, they're generally settlement discounts of around about 7.5% for 14 days, and it'll be around about anywhere 2.5% to 5% for 30 day payment. It's much cheaper to fund the invoice for 60 days than it is to actually pay the settlement discount. But, um, and we've done the math on that for a number of clients. It can capitalise on better supplier terms. So the flip side is you can go back to your customers and say, well, I'm not waiting 60 days to be paid from Telstra, I've actually got the money now. So what's the benefit to go to your supplier? Um, some of the key ones we've seen for that, steel industry, paper industry, when there's 60 day terms generally for supply, all of a sudden you go to the supplier, I can pay you in seven days, I can pay you in 14 days. What sort of pricing advantage can you get out of Can you get a better price? Can you get your own settlement discount? The main area where we come into play is literally most of our clients are with us because traditional finance isn't for them or they've exhausted their ability to do it. And I'll show you a slide shortly that illustrates that. And the other piece that we can do is certainly for growing businesses, startup businesses where they're maybe not as strong in the back office, we've got an ability to assist with the collections of the receivables as well.
adults. We've got a team in here that they spend most of the day sending out collection correspondence, making up <coughs> collection phone calls and actually chasing up the debts on behalf of our customers. So this is a really good example of when we talk about bank financing versus what debtor finance does. You can see there the overdrafts just a straight line going across the screen. So typically a bank, um, when they look at your overdraft facility, there's normally one of my lines. What did you put up as a security? So if you put up your house in, in Brunswick and said, yep, I've got a $2 million house in Brunswick, uh, the bank said, well, you've got a home line on there already, you've got a million dollars, we'll go up to 80% on your property, and the difference is what they'll give you as an overdraft. It has no correlation to your sales 90% of the time. Whereas debtor finance does, you can see there on the graph that as the sales are increasing, the debtor finance is moving consistently with 80% of those sales. So that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to move with the business as it grows. And that also enables the, your funding to actually adjust for seasonal peaks and troughs as well. So if you've got a large seasonal peak coming into, into June, uh, if you've got a large seasonal peak coming into Christmas, the, business, the facility will actually move up with that seasonal peak because it's linked directly to sales. In terms of our product offering, some of that's come out reasonably small and is horrendously hard to read even from this distance. <laughs> There's a few different things we do there. So invoice discounting is just a facility where literally our customer still undertakes all the debt collection. They send out all the invoices on their own behalf and we are in the background and your customers are none the wiser that we are there. They don't know that we exist in the funding process. You are managing everything from that debt collection process. So it's probably for more well-established businesses who have a good back office around that. Some of the things that Greg mentioned, you know, you've got somebody there dedicated to collections. You've probably got at least an internal bookkeeper. We run a disclosed version of that product, which basically means that essentially we're involved in the collection process on that product. And then we do what we call cooperation, where we assist with certain things like we might send out statements and reminder letters on your behalf and they're automated out of our system, but you still own the client relationship. We don't get involved in the collection then. One thing that we have noted in there, uh, bad debt protection. Again, Greg touched on some of the ways to protect your business from an insurance perspective. We do have an overlay where we actually provide credit protection on the debtors. So if you've taken up the bad debt protection and a client doesn't pay, you're actually insured within, within the parameters of that product. So there's a premium obviously attached to it. Um, the benefits of using that versus using a actual trade credit insurance policy is we'll let you do selected debtors. Most trade insurance policies want you to do the entire book and they charge you for the entire book. Whereas we can just look at selected debtors where you say, well, I'm dealing with uh, so on the phones, I'm dealing with Telstra, JB Hi-Fi, they're going into Woolworths Group, they're going into Coles. So I'm not worried about insuring those guys because they're public business and I can see what they do every day of the week. But I've got a whole little raft of you know Telstra stores and mobile phone stores and they're the guys I want to insure. So you can actually break those guys out and insure them separately. The other thing we do on there, we also fund progress claims. So if you're building the construction industry, we, we can provide support there as well. There's a couple of things we haven't touched on in that slide. Um, we also just do single invoices. So if a client comes to us and says, I just need to get over a little bit of a cash flow hurdle, I've got one invoice for $50,000 that I need some funding on, we can do that as a single invoice transaction. So some of those clients will actually sign up with us on basically an open-ended agreement, and they will just give us invoices periodically when they need some support. So we might get a $50,000 invoice this month, we might send another invoice out of that client for two or three months, and they give us another one for and just to, again, just keep on getting over those little cash flow hurdles. Other than that, um, contact details are there and it's you know, fairly straightforward what we do. It's literally our, our positioning is around having one of the broadest offerings in the market. So we've got some banking competitors that do invoice discounting, but they don't do some of the factory type stuff where we're actually getting involved in the collection. None of our competitors are doing bad debt protection pieces as an add-on. So there's a few things there that we just do that are a little bit different to what happens in the market. As we mentioned, we are the largest uh, non-bank debtor financier in the space. We're publicly listed, so if everything we do has got a high level of visibility and, uh, and accountability, as you'd expect from a listed group. Um, but I'll leave it at that and we'll hand back to Greg. Thank you, Shane. All right. All right. So coming to the, towards the end, so I thought I was going to wrap up with a couple of sort of um, concepts here. The first ones are really around the seven key numbers. So this is a tool that uh, we use really to identify areas of opportunity uh, for increasing profits and cash flow. 
consciousness. And really it's really around all those concepts we've just been talking about. Looking at all those numbers and working out where there's opportunity to, to improve, to help improve the, the bottom line. So this is an example of a business that is a, has a, a turnover of a million dollars where we have identified $100,000 of cash flow improvements, which translates to 60 grand of profit improvement. So pretty, a pretty good improvement. And the way we did this was really going down here and looking at the key numbers. So as an example, cost of sales. Um, getting the cost of sales down by 1%, obviously improves both, cap cost, um, both profits and cash. Looking at overheads, quite often, uh, look, business owners are so busy, they don't really look at their overheads, they right? just pay bills. If you spend a bit of time doing a bit of a shop around of utilities and your rental and all that sort of stuff, you know, we'll usually generate quite a lot of save in that area. Improving uh, accounts collections, as I spoke about, so quite often businesses have very poor day receivable, so getting that back to target is the goal. So in this example it was 11 days, so that's 32000 dollars of improved cash flow. Uh, in decreasing your working process and your inventory. So getting rid of that dead stock, uh, making sure that you're ordering just in time. Um, those sort of things will help reduce your number of inventory days. Um, looking at opportunities for small price increases. A lot of, a lot of businesses are very scared to do price increases because they think businesses are going to um, you know, go somewhere else. That is sometimes true, but quite often it is not. Um, because quite often your customers are not only shopping with you or transacting with you because of price, but you also have a lot of credibility and, and value that you're adding in the relationship. So, Usually, a small price increase, 1, 2%, sometimes 3%, um, won't really muddy the waters in terms of uh, the relationship, will help you keep you know, up to date with CPI increases. And then looking at the accounts payable, so you know, are there any opportunities here? As I said, this is a tool that we use for all the businesses that we uh, engage with, and it really helps focus in on where are the key uh, opportunities in the business, and then working with the business owner to execute those opportunities so that turn into real improvements to the bottom line. Okay, so I thought I'd whip up that testimonial. Uh, so this is one of our customers, Nolan's, Tra Nolan's Transport, uh, who are a big cartage company. I'm not gonna go through all the words there, you can have a read. But basically, you know, this, this client was very similar to all the clients we, can, we engage with. They typically have very poor processes, don't have a dashboard, didn't have KPIs, didn't have a budget. We're, we're tracking their profits at that detail level. Um, you know, in this case, was at truck level, so to understand how, how utilised the trucks were. Um, didn't have a, profit, uh, a budget, and didn't have a cash flow either. So in this situation, worked with the business owner to get all these things in place. And as a result of that, improved profits by 27%. So the way we, we work is really around whatever we charge in fees is going to be paid, more than paid for while we call new money. Incremental profits, incremental cash. And typically the target is six to 10 times. And that's, that's really what we, we focus on. Okay, so we're at the end of the presentation. Hope you found it uh, useful and interesting. Um, so, it's a bit of a thank you for coming today. We do have a number of different offers that you can participate in, which are on, on screen here. Uh, so, it's a complimentary profit and cash flow health check, a complimentary, that should be number two, we put another number on there. They're all number one, they're all important, <laughs> number one. They've all got equal billing. Yeah. Uh, seven key numbers, that previous slide, you do that sort of assessment for your business to work out where those opportunities are. A systems tuner. Sounding board session, you might be wanting to you know, talk about different business strategy and where you want to head, not quite sure you want to have a discussion with the business. And then finally around zero, um, so a free trial, one month, and also help getting the system set up. So if you're on another system, getting that data into zero uh, and setting it up uh, to, to, to sort of work with your business. Okay. So, we will have this, we have recorded this event, so it will be on our website as a webinar. So we'll send out an email to that. Um, here are the links. Um, 
On your desk is also a, um, a form, which is an evaluation form. And also, if you're interested in any of those uh, reviews or discussions, you can just tick the box and we'll be in contact with you. So that ends our discussion. So what I'll do now is open up for any um, Q&As for either myself, Amy, or Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good. Don Costa, where's my hard hitting data point next question? Uh, He's <laughs> saying no, my, my facilities are better. No, no, I think uh, truly in life you've got to put the customer at the centre of everything. So whatever works is the main objective. And if you do that, I think our you know, outcomes are a natural uh, byproduct of good customer engagement. So, uh, no, I think what you have to say there is really cool and uh, should be more readily embraced. I think the point is, if you were just touching on there, that the solutions are always going to be different for every client. So mm. it's really about understanding the business and tailoring a solution, whatever it is, and it's always very different, um, including all the financial solutions Absolutely. for that client, right? In terms of maximising their objectives. That's what it's really all about. Yeah, I think on the finance side, you um, touched on it quite briefly, had the, um, the trade cycle. Right. And for any client, if their banker does not know what that customer's trade cycle is, they don't understand the business. If they haven't sat down and spent the time to say, how do you get from point A when you've ordered a good to point C, D, E when you've actually received a dollar back at the door, if they haven't worked through that with you, they don't understand the business. Until they've done that, they can't give you a proper financing solution. So whether it's something that I do or whether it's something the bank does, if they haven't understood that part of the business, that's it. Yeah. If they're not on the right track, they can't be. I'd say it's fundamental for any relationship. You've got to always make sure, like you said, put always the customer first. But what are the solutions that are going to help them out? Finance is just one aspect of it. What are the other relationships that helps that business grow? Because at the end of the day, we have one goal is to help that client. So what is everything around it and what are the relationships and is everyone talking to one another? Because really what you are doing is creating almost like a family dynamic to help that small business or that customer growing. Good as your question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to ask a question. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, well, um, can you do cash flow um, projections, like what customer would be yeah. doing? Yeah, so you can do budget. So budgets versus actual, and you can do reporting from there as well. So we've got a full budget manager within Zero. So you can do, you can create on an Excel spreadsheet, upload it via CSV. Yeah. Um, so you can get it all from within Zero, like all the, um, the template and so forth, right. or you can enter the figures directly into zero as well. Okay. And that would integrate with the bank standards already, but like if you connect that with your bank directly, sort of. So, yeah, so what you can do is, as you saw the custom margin report, you can create a budget versus actual report and create that and send it to the bank and so forth like that as well. So, what I have heard and what I used to do as well is a lot of the clients I used to work with, we used to give the bank. Like we made sure that like obviously the banker knew zero quite well and what they were doing. We used to give them read-only access and then publish reports for the bank and then they used to jump in there and then make their analysis and so forth like that. That's why zero is such a fantastic solution because you've got real-time data and you can produce reports for the day. So what you need to do is again make sure you surround yourself with the people around you, including your bookkeeper, your accountant, your bank and yourself. Get everything in there and make sure that you guys are getting the right information to help you grow your business going forward as well. I think the important point there is um, like on the previous slide, talking about setup. So the system has a lot of capability, but unless you know what's available and you have the right people to help you set it up for your business, you're not going to extract the full value. So you really, you really, you really, um, in the best situation to spend that time making sure you set up the system mm -hmm. right, you know, whether it's before you go in or after, to provide the information you need. Because that's what it's all about. Having the information at your fingertips when you need it, anywhere, you know, on your phone, yeah. when you're on the train, wherever, so that you can react to issues as they arise. Right. The biggest thing I found as well within Zero and the reporting aspect as well is a lot of small business owners, um, and even just business owners in general, doesn't necessarily mean they're small, they don't understand a PL and balance sheet. So, what advisors need to do with their clients is to be able to create a report 
so the owner actually understands what's going on with their business. There's no point walking into a meeting, having that conversation with the client and they go, cool, this is how your business is operating, we'll see you next year. You need to make the reports meaningful so the business owner knows exactly what is happening. That's what the strength is within Zero is you can create those reports as I showed you before. Any other broad questions? All right. So thank you so much everyone for participating. Obviously there's plenty of food back there, so help yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to talking to you. The main purpose of today's event was really helping to de demystify the world of numbers for business owners. So a lot of business owners don't really have a good understanding of business numbers and more importantly, you know, what are the drivers of their profitability and cash flow in their business. So what I really wanted to do today is give them, touch on all the key points so they have a basic understanding of what can drive their business forward and more importantly know about what they don't know so that they know where to ask for help and who to ask for help if they, if they need. The key takeaways, I think I have about three of them. The first one's really around dashboard reporting. So having a, a, a dashboard that has all of your key metrics, that are your levers for profitable growth and cash flow is very important for a business owner. So having a report that's both timely, accurate and regular, and provides the owner with an oversight of all the metrics that are important to running their business, and is very important. Knowing when those metrics are going red or going off track, and knowing when to respond to them. I guess that's number one. The second one's really around understanding your true profitability. And what I mean by that is getting a true understanding of your profits at a product level, at a customer level, at a business segment level. And that's really important because what you find is when you get into the detail, you'll find that there are some customers or some segments that you, or products you're making money on and some that you're not. So with that knowledge, you can make a lot of really powerful decisions around um, increasing revenue, uh, maybe decreasing you know, business in areas you're not making money. And also understanding when you do do a bit of marketing, where do you focus your marketing dollars? It's really around those segments that are going to drive your profit. So having knowledge of where those segments are profitable will ensure that you have a very wise spend of your marketing dollar. I guess the key roadblock I, I see businesses mainly have is really around having access to the business numbers that they need to know to be able to drive performance of their business. So what I mean by that is really um, having the data at their fingertips and knowing where the business is performing well, where it's not performing as well, and being able to use that data to help drive the business forward. So one of the roadblocks I find is many businesses have systems in place, um, but they're not using those systems to their full capability in, in terms of providing the level of granularity and the data that they need to drive their business forward. I guess the, the, the best advice I can offer a business owner is really stick to what you're good at. And what I mean by that is that business owners are in business typically because they're good at something and they have a passion for something. And what I typically find is as the business grows, that business owner gets sort of um, taken over in other areas such as you know, accounting and finance and HR, insurance, all those sort of topics, IT. And they're all areas that they're typically not very good at as well. So what tends to happen is the business owners get sidetracked and spend too much time on these items that number one, they don't enjoy, number two, cause frustration, and number three, distract them from focusing on the areas of the business that will, will really you know, ensure that they grow. So my, business, my, my advice would be get the right advice, get the right help, know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, and what you're not good at, get the right people in place to help you. The number one key to success for a new business is really around getting yourself set up properly from the start. I think that's really important. Um, getting the right help in place, getting the right financial systems, getting the right uh, processes, getting the right procedures in place are all very important. What I find is that the businesses that are more successful tend to be the ones that invest time at the start in getting things right and providing the level of information they need to run the business. The businesses that are less successful sort of get into it, the business grows, they get a bit out of control, they then try to get things back into control and that, that creates a lot of work 
and also sidetracks them again from doing what they do best, which is growing the business. So it's really important to get the right systems in place, the right processes in place at the start. I suppose the main advice overall was that it was, I think, every, all the speakers came across um, to deliver a holistic approach to the way that I should run a business. And for me, that's very important at this point in time, considering um, at what stage I am very early on um, in, in development. So I think it was a, a, a very good presentation to, to really get the guts of what you should be doing at the, at the very beginning. The takeaway that I got from uh, today was dashboard reporting, the KPI reporting, um, all the integration with um, uh, the numbers and the figures that s sometimes I don't fully understand, um, and, and that integrating with um, programs such as Xero, uh, uh, which can really help my, my business uh, thrive. With my business, I think the, the areas I need help with the most is definitely the reporting side of things, uh, definitely growth and cash flow uh, at this point in time, obviously being a small business. Uh, to summarise it, I, I'd need to be able to you know, understand how I can implement strategies and ultimately grow the business as a whole. I'd really recommend uh, the seminar. I, I thought it was a fantastic educational piece. Uh, it really summarised, um, you know, how to sort of get started in, in, in business and, you know, it gave a really good overview of, of you know, and, and scope of what small business owners really look at to, to, to thrive and, and grow. And um, yeah, it's, it provided me with an invaluable piece of information.